Okay, so I'm telling you very welcome for a second day of Cloud Rejects um, in the VIP arena. I hope you survived the first day very nice, had the nice talks, had the nice networking. And uh, so we start with a security and identity topic today to get you hot on, you know, on a good, uh, good information flow. So I will hand over to the speaker and enjoy. Yeah. Thank you. So there are two things that are good to wake up in the morning. So first thing is coffee, and the second one is my 100 plus slides presentations. So today we will go through one of these. And before the talk, I want to thank you uh, people who made this talk possible. So thank you for KubeCon committee members for rejecting me. Uh, yeah, okay, so um, my name is Maxim. I am working uh, for the company called Pelerk. We are a service company, so uh, you have probably seen the CNCF uh, landscape. So with all the application, we may help people. So we may set up them, configure, deploy, and support 24-7. So this is what the service company usually does. And in my free time, I am the... Um, Open source contributor, I usually contribute to authentication or an authorization projects, and I'm also the maintainer of the project called DEX. So today we will discuss the new exciting feature in DEX called the token exchange and how we can use it to build the secure cloud native environments. Uh, and the introduction is a couple of jokes, okay, done. Uh, so then we, <laughs> we are going to tell what DEX is about. So some facts. Uh, Dex originally was developed by the CoreOS company back in 2015, so it's already nine years old. Uh, in 2018, after the CoreOS acquisition by Red Hat, so it was like dropped out of the company, and now this is the community-driven project. And uh, since the 2020, it's a CNCF sandbox project. Uh, we uh, almost have 9K stars, 1.6K forks, and more than 25 adopters I personally know about, but probably there are more of them. <laughs> so, uh, the, main, uh, the main idea of DEX, what, what is DEX about? Uh, usually people say that DEX is the identity provider, but it's not quite right. So the right thing is that DEX acts as a portal to other identity providers. So uh, it can use, uh, it can connect other providers uh, to, to DEX. Uh, so, uh, and this led DEX uh, defer authentication to LDAP service, SAML providers, or established identity providers like GitHub, uh, Google, and Active Directory, and many, many more providers. And the idea is that clients just need to write their authentication logic once to talk to DEX by using the standard OpenID Connect client library existed, that exists for basically any languages. There, there is one library. And then the DEX can handle all the other protocols. So the basic, as they say, the idea of DEX is like this. Yeah, on this side we have the standard OpenID Connect interface, and uh, as input we can have many, many different protocols. Uh, and this is DEX. So why do engineers love DEX? Uh, it's ultralight, so this is just a single binary written in Go on approximately 35 megabytes in size. Uh, DEX is simple, so the code base is uh, small, simple. You can just spend a couple of hours to get the, all the concepts that are used in DEX, so it's not that hard. Uh, DEX is Kubernetes native, so it was developed for Kubernetes, and it runs well off on, on top of Kubernetes. We will discuss it today uh, in details later. So uh, DEX is a community's building block, so it's not only used as a provider, but also as a dependency in other projects like Argo CD or Six Store, so they're using DEX uh, in their deployments. And DEX is true open source project, so this is a community-driven project, not owned by a company, so we are just surviving somehow <laughs> without salaries. Uh, yeah, so that's why engineers love DEX. Um, architecture. So uh, we have DEX, and uh, as I've told you before, there is a standard OpenID Connect interface, and through this interface we can connect users, by using the standard auth code flow, or we can connect also machines by using other flows like uh, password credential flows or the thing we will discuss today, the token exchange one. 
so DEX is a stateful service, so it needs uh, to store somewhere the data, and there are many, many options. So first, you can use the uh, relational database like PostgreSQL, MySQL, or SQLite for this. Uh, but because the schema of the data of DEX is pretty simple, we can use even a key value storage. For example, we can use add CD to store data. It's also possible. And if we run in DEX on top of Kubernetes, we don't even need a storage, so we can use a Kubernetes as a storage. DEX can store the data in, in Kubernetes custom resources. And if we are just testing something, we can use in memory storage. Um, it, this is not persistent, but uh, for test, it's okay. And the final concept uh, uh, I need to explain to you is connectors. So we can connect uh, other providers to DEX. For example, if you're a big enterprise company, you probably already have a key clock or active directory, so you can use them to authenticate through DEX. Uh, if you're a small company, uh, you're a startup, you only want to write code and you only have Git repos, so you can use your Git provider for authentication. And there are also two special cases. The first one is local users. If you, for example, want to test your connection without the provider, this is also possible. Or the mock connector, if you want to use DEX as a web server for test in your, mm, I don't know, for, for your integration tests. So this is a mock connector. OK, uh, this is what I want to tell you about architecture. So this part is done. Uh, moving to the next uh, step, explain what token exchange is. So token exchange grant, the, the main reason why <laughs> this talk is happening today. Uh, this, uh, th there is a special RFC, uh, 8936, uh, don't Google it. <laughs> I will explain <laughs> the whole RFC to you today. So this is the extension uh, for allows to the flow uh, that mm, defines the token exchange grant. This is the additional way how you can get tokens from DEX. And this is not a new thing. So it was published in 2020, a long time ago. So, but, but in DEX it was implemented not, not so long ago, so like last year. Okay, but to explain the token exchange to you, I will explain you, instead I will explain you the real world thing that we use uh, often, the currency exchange. So, imagine you have a euro, and if you're a software engineer, you probably have more euros, even more euros, but this is before you paid taxes in Europe, so now you have just a <laughs> normal amount of euros. And uh, these euros, they are issued by the European Union. So there are special signs on coins, on banknotes, so you can verify that this euro is valid. And euros are used by different countries among the European Union, so you may go with the euro to France and buy a croissant here, yeah? This is possible. But what if you want to go to Japan and buy sushi there? Uh, it will not work because there is another currency in Japan and they, not ac they do not accept euros. And this is just how the world works, yeah? We, don't, we cannot have the same currency everywhere because of geopolitical reasons, because this is just not how the world works, yeah? There are many different currencies. What can we do in this situation? So we may go to some strange guy <laughs> and exchange the currency. Uh, with him, so we, we may give this guy a euro, and in exchange we will receive the yena. And with yena we can travel to Japan and finally buy and enjoy our sushi. And there is a Scooby-Doo moment, so let's rip the mask off. And this whole time we were, <laughs> we were <laughs> talking about token exchange, not about currencies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so currencies there are uh, JWT tokens issued by different providers, and Sushi is the access we want to have to the server protected by another provider, and the strange uh, exchanger guy is the, <laughs> the DEX in this schema. So, the token exchange in DEX, uh, uh, sorry for my uh, pronunciation, but it was implemented by Sean Liao. Uh, this is uh, the valuable contribution, so many thanks to this, uh, to this GitHub user. Uh, 
Uh, so it was merged by November 2023, and uh, it's available in the latest version of DEX uh, that was uh, released in January 2024. Uh, and the thing that it works with other JWT tokens, and uh, to be able to validate the tokens, uh, DEX requires uh, the provider to have the OIDC discovery endpoint. So to get the keys and to get the issuer to, valid, to, to, be, to be able to check that tokens are valid for exchange. So, and uh, yeah, the idea is simple. We have some G GVT issued by another provider, for example, by Kubernetes, and uh, there are sub and, uh, and expire, expire claim, and uh, we can use these claims from original token as the base for other non-standard claims and decks. For example, uh, the sub and expiration claims will be different uh, in the DEX token, but uh, there may be some, some properties from the original token in DEX token. So that, that's how exchange works. Uh, yes, so you can see that the sub claim uh, from the Kubernetes token now becomes the name claim of the DEX token. Uh, to enable this feature in DEX, you only need to ensure that the grant is enabled, uh, and it's enabled by default, so you don't need to bother yourself, only if you want to disable this. And uh, we we'll also need to define a connector. Uh, you can see the YAML file here uh, for the connector, so the most important thing there is the issuer. And uh, that's it. So. This is all you need to do, uh, to start exchanging tokens index. Uh, so it's easy to understand the, the feature because we have a good real world example. It's easy to start because it's easy to deploy DEX in general. It's easy to configure. And this is the great field for experiments. So let's move on and discuss uh, the practical use cases, how we can use this feature in our current cloud native environment, yeah, how it's applicable. The first case is CI-CD integration. Uh, so the goal is to deploy to a Kubernetes cluster. So we, we always need to deploy something to Kubernetes. And there are two common anti-patterns. So the first one is to bring the kube config for administrator from the cluster to your GitHub runner. This is not good because if you lose this config, yeah, so everybody knows that this is not a good thing to do. Another anti-pattern is to use the service account token with the infinite lifetime, also not the great thing. Uh, so uh, instead we can use the token exchange feature and there is a workflow illustration of how we can do this. So the actors here is uh, GitLab CICD, DEX, and Kubernetes. So first thing we need to connect DEX as a Open AD Connect provider to Kubernetes. So uh, now we can use Dex tokens to go to Kubernetes. Uh, at this point, GitLab cannot access Kubernetes clusters. But what we need to do, we need to define GitLab as a, we need to connect GitLab to Dex uh, with the connector thing. So because GitLab has the Open AD uh, Connect discovery endpoint, so we can point Dex to this endpoint. And now DEX can verify GitLab tokens. Uh, and this is the peak point of the, <laughs> of the workflow. So uh, on each pipeline execution, GitLab issues a token. And with this token, we cannot go straight to the Kubernetes API, but we can go to DEX, exchange this token, and then use it to access Kubernetes API. So pretty, pretty simple workflow. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and this is not only GitLab specific case, so you can use it with other CICD systems for like GitHub Actions is also a great example. Uh, and uh, all major cloud providers allow authenticating using the CICD tokens. So you can go to AWS and create machines there. So why cannot you go to Kubernetes and create pods? So now with DEX you can. So now it's possible. Uh, and no more anti-patterns. So now we have proper short-lived short -lived tokens. Uh, the second case is Kubernetes out mesh. Uh, the goal is to give access to a service from one cluster to another cluster, so to, uh, to be able to control workflows from other clusters from the, the single one. Uh, 
the, it may be required for Istio multi-cluster feature, for example, to configure Istio multi-cluster. Or it's also maybe required, for example, for Argus CD to manage uh, different Kubernetes from the single one. Okay, and the patterns are the same here. Uh, let's look. Uh, let's look, dive in uh, in the workflow. Uh, actors here are Dex and three different Kubernetes clusters. Uh, first thing we need to do is to connect Dex as an Open ID Connect provider to all these clusters one by one. So the first one, second one, and the third one. So now we can use Dex tokens to authenticate in all these clusters. The second thing that we need to do is to define three connectors in DEX. So now Kubernetes uh, registered uh, as uh, the authentication providers in DEX. So now can DEX verify their tokens? Uh, one, two, three. So, and now it defines the whole, uh, like whole mesh be between these clusters. And now from one cluster, we cannot go with the service account token to another cluster because it's, it's not possible, right? But we can go with this token to DEX and exchange it and finally <laughs> have an access from one cluster to another. Uh, yeah, some mind blowing maybe example, but yeah, let's, <laughs> let's go further. And um, uh, now I will show you how we can define a kube config for such authentication. So we will use exec credentials plugin feature. Uh, and first we need to write our exec plugin and we will use shell for this. The simple example, first of all, we need to get the service account data. This is our initial token. The second, that we need to exchange initial token with the request to DEX to add DEX token. And the third thing we need to do is just to return the JSON structure, and this is what makes this uh, shell script a proper exec credentials plugin. So the development of plugin is finished. Now we can go <laughs> and save this plugin to the execu executable uh, directory. We need to give this script execution rights. And then we will be able to use this uh, script in the kube config like it's shown uh, on the screen. Uh, I want to tell you that this is not the production ready script, obviously. <laughs> so there are not uh, error handling and other things, but this is just a simple example to show the idea of it, and it also works. <laughs> uh, so this is the full example. Yeah, so this was the Kubernetes auth mesh, and the third case is spiffy tokens. Uh, so the goal is to use spiffy tokens to have an access to Kubernetes API, because if we already have all our services authenticated, why cannot we use these tokens for authentication in Kubernetes API? So Let's uh, let's just see the workflow. There are now five actors, like the DEX itself, the Spire server, and the Spire agent uh, that we will use in our example to issue spiffy tokens, the application itself, and the Kubernetes cluster. First thing we need to do is the registration between Spire server and Spire agent. So the, uh, we need to make the agent uh, eligible for issuing tokens for all the workloads on a node. The second thing is that we need to register uh, Spiffy ser uh, Spire server, uh, excuse me, uh, Spire server as the with the connector index. So now Dex can verify uh, these tokens. The second thing is that we usually do, we connect DEX to Kubernetes, so DEX uh, tokens now accessible by the Kubernetes API. And then we can finally start our flow. So the application goes to the agent and gets the spiffy token. Uh, with spiffy token, it cannot access Kubernetes API, but it can exchange the spiffy token for a DEX token and then connect to Kubernetes. And with this schema, you can use spiffy IDs as usernames like this in your RBAC rules. And it makes service accounts in Kubernetes obsolete. So you don't need to use service accounts anymore in Kubernetes with this schema. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. So uh, we finally made it to the finals. Uh, this was the talk. So let's uh, wrap up all the things said today. The first thing is that the token exchange feature is the glue between different authentication providers. 
The second thing is that BEX is lightweight and it can be used to add only this capability to Kubernetes clusters with literally no overhead. So it, because this is lightweight, this is not a fully featured provider and uh, you will not see the BEX working <laughs> here in your cluster. Okay, the third thing is that uh, not only DEX benefits from it, yet the whole ecosystem, so because uh, as I showed you before, it DEX now can connect different projects of our cloud native environments to work together, which is pretty cool. And the final thing is that if security features are convenient to use, uh, it will improve security in the world in general, because security now, it's not only necessity, but also like a popular thing. So <laughs> if popular things are convenient to use, uh, everyone will use them. Yeah, it was my talk. Thank you so much. Let's go to authenticate them all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much, Maxim, for your great talk. And we have uh, some minutes left of your time. So if you guys have some questions, uh, it's a good time for Q&A. Uh, uh, so the question is, uh, do we have an example how people can access Kubernetes API through CI CD uh, as I have showed you before? Probably you need an example of kubeconfig uh, or, or what? Uh, so, uh, you, you, okay, uh, so you need a DEX configuration. Uh, for now, we do not have this example, but there are people that already do so, so I think we probably uh, can ask them to provide us to share the example. So, uh, yeah, this is a good question. Uh, please? So, you mentioned in your talk configuring Kubernetes cluster to use DEX yeah. as identity provider. How that works in a managed Kubernetes in a cloud, AKS, GKE, AKS? Uh, so uh, how we can connect uh, an OpenID Connect provider to a managed Kubernetes like uh, AWS, uh, GKE, and something like this. So in most major providers, you can do so. Uh, I know that in EKS and in uh, GCE, there is a special like interface, a web form, you, you may feel it and the new cluster will work with your OpenID Connect provider. Uh, there were some issues in uh, AKS in Azure, but it's also, it's also possible probably. <laughs> and in some uh, minor providers, like for example in OVH, it's also possible. Uh, but you, you need to check this feature. That's it. <laughs> Uh, so what is stored in the persistent layer of DEX? Uh, we usually store there our authentication codes. Uh, so for example, when your user authenticates in DEX, you need to persist the data between the login and the redirect from the another provider to, to DEX back. Uh, so you need to, so it's only for a short moment, but you need to store this data. There are also things like, for example, connectors. Uh, so you, you don't need to define your connectors in the config file. You can store connectors in the database. It's also possible. You can do this via API, uh, also convenient thing. And Dex, says, uh, Dex also stores the refresh tokens uh, in this storage, for example. So it keeps the offline session there, or sessions. Uh, and that's pretty much it. There are a couple of more tables, but they are not that relevant. Any more questions? So, yeah, thank you so much for, for the questions. Yes, also, thank you.